Hello dear students, so I am here today to discuss with you the AIMS November 2018 questions as we are not very far off from NEET PG 2019 so we should be all prepared with the questions with AIMS 2018 also. So let's begin. Uh, see the question number one. Here we are given a visual of an infant, a child with photophobia, lacrimation is most likely to have. Now if you see this visual, what is actually prominent here? Uh, what I always say, this is actually a blue baby. And whenever you see a blue baby, what are the things that should come to your mind? The first thing, it can be a blue sclera because it is giving a bluish hue. So it can be a blue sclera also and another thing where you are getting blue sclera along with the other things like what they have given is the photophobia and lacrimation. Now how to approach this type of question? Let's see. When you have to approach this type of question, we have to see where you can get this lacrimation and where you can get the photophobia. Now let's begin with the lacrimation here. If you see this lacrimation, an infant having lacrimation basically can have two things. Either there can be the congenital glaucoma, it can be a congenital glaucoma or it can be a congenital decryocystitis congenital decryocystitis which are considered to be the main two causes of watering in a newborn or an infant or a child. So we have got two things, one is congenital glaucoma and one is congenital decryocystitis. Now they have not given the decryocystitis here. So obviously there is a stronger possibility of congenital glaucoma here plus what are the things that will go in favor with this congenital glaucoma? Another thing is the photophobia. Now because here they are giving photophobia also, this photophobia is a characteristic feature found in the congenital glaucoma. In fact, a patient who is having congenital glaucoma, as I usually say, always presents with BPL card. Now what is this BPL card? B presents with the blepharospasm. B presents with the blepharospasm means it is the spasm of the eyelids and along with this blepharospasm there is P and there is L that is there is photophobia P for photophobia and L for lacrimation. So whenever a child is presenting with these three things we have blepharospasm, we have photophobia and we have lacrimation then usually our diagnosis is strongly suspicion of what you call as buphthalmos or congenital glaucoma. So what is this actually? Buphthalmos. This condition is called as Buphthalmos. And what are the other things that goes in favor of this Buphthalmos? Look at here. Can you see the large size cornea? So we have got a large cornea also here which will go in favor of this Buphthalmos. One is the large cornea because the increase intraocular pressure at this age will lead to increase in the size of the eyeball and increase in the size of the eyeball also is accompanied with the increase in the size of cornea. Not, not only we have large cornea, we also have hazy cornea. So if you see here, we have large size cornea also, we have a hazy cornea also and along with this, this bluish sclera which is visible, this is called as blue sclera. So the blue sclera here, then we have got the large cornea, then we have got the hazy cornea, then we have blepharospasm, we have photophobia, we have lacrimation and these are ample of things which are combinedly giving you the strong possibility of this patient having congenital glaucoma called as buphthalmos. So we have B for buphthalmos, some of the important things about the buphthalmos, just a quick revision, the B for buphthalmos is also B for bilateral B for boys, it's more common in boys. Then B for blue sclera, we have blue sclera here. Then we have B for blepharospasm, we have blepharospasm also here. And then we have got also B for backward subluxation. We have backward subluxation of the lens. 
So this child who is having photophobia and lacrimation is basically having the buftal moss. We have bilateral involvement also. We have large size cornea. We have hazy cornea. We have blue sclera. And then we have got the backward subluxation of the lens. Now, when you are trying to do a question, you should know why this is the answer. But you should also know why the all other options are not the answer. So let's see why other things are not the answer. If you go with the retinoblastoma, RB is retinoblastoma. In retinoblastoma, we can have unilateral involvement also. We can have bilateral involvement also. Plus, you should have leukocoria. The earliest as well as most important sign of retinoblastoma is the leukocoria, the whitish pupillary reflex. So therefore, this can't be the answer. Now, why not the megalocornea? The other question, why not megalocornea? It's not megalocornea because it is showing other things also apart from this large size cornea. Because we are having haziness also, we are having uh, blue sclera also, we are having the blepharospasm also, we are having photophobia and lacrimation also. So all these things will again rule out megalocornea and there is no possibility of all these symptoms in cases of megalocornea. Now, Another thing is the corneal dystrophy. In corneal dystrophy, again, we won't have the large cornea, we won't have the hazy cornea, and rather we will have the degeneration, which are usually present in the periphery of the cornea. Plus, these dystrophies are usually non-inflammatory. They are bilateral, but they are non-inflammatory. Therefore, there will be no photophobia. Therefore, again, corneal dystrophy is not a possibility. So, answer here is the congenital glaucoma or the buphthalmos. Now, coming to the second one. Now, again, a very important question. And uh, uh, for this year, again, especially for NEET, uh, we are hoping that you will get a question on visual acuity because visual acuity they are asking in a row. Two questions in DNB, June 2018, one question in November, AIMS 2018 and maybe another to go in the NEET also. So let's see what is this. The angle subtended by the topmost letter of the Snellens chart at a distance of 6 meter. Now let's see what is the concept of this uh, Snellens chart actually. Suppose uh, this we are having the Snellens chart and uh, it is the most common visual equity chart that we are taking for the screening and the visual equity recording. Now what you are getting here in the Snellens chart, the topmost letter is usually the largest letter of the chart like this and uh, the patient will be standing at a distance of 6 meters. At a distance of 6 meters, this patient is standing. Now, this letter should be seen by a normal person. If you see by a normal person, then normal person can read this letter from 60 meters. While the patient is reading it from 6 meters. Listen again. The normal person will read this letter from 60 meters while the patient is reading it from 6 meters and that is why when we are able to read this letter from a distance of 6 meters the visual equity will be 6 by 60. So the topmost letter if the patient is able to read from a distance of 6 meters the visual equity is actually 6 by 60. Now what is the meaning of this 6 and what is the meaning of this 60? The 6 which is present in the numerator actually means the distance of the patient from the chart while the denominator. The denominator 60 means what is the comparison from where the patient can see in relation to the normal person from which he is normal person is seen. So with respect to a normal person this patient is having 6 by 60 because normal person can see this letter from 60 meters and this patient is seeing from 6 meters. Similarly now the size of letter will go on decreasing. Suppose in the next line we are having a we are having x. Now if the patient is again reading it from 6 meters the normal person can read this from 36 meter because a normal person can read this from 36 meter therefore the visual acuity will be 6 by 36 and it will be so on that means the size of the letter will go on decreasing 
Now when the size of the letter will go on decreasing, this means the distance from which a normal person can see these letters will also go on decreasing. So it is 6 by 60, then 6 by 36, then we have 6 by 24, then we have got 6 by 18, then 6 by 12, and finally we have 6 by 6. So 6 by 6 means what? 6 by so we have got 6 by 12 and then we have got the 6 by 9 and then we have 6 by 6. Now what is the meaning of this 6 by 6 now? Means the distance from which a normal person can see this letter is same as that of the patient and therefore his vision is normal 6 by 6. Now another important thing which they had asked in DNB also they said that a person comes to you and he is having a vision 6 by 24. Suppose a patient comes to us and he is having a vision of 6 by 24, right? Now from which distance a normal person can see this? So the distance at which a normal person is able to read this line will be 24 meters. So this was asked in DNB 2018. While another important concept why I can say that the topmost letter is visible from 60 meters by a normal person? Why I can say that next line is visible to a normal person at a distance of 36 meters? Why I can say that next normal line, this line can be read by a normal person from a distance of 24 meters and so on? Why? Because there is a concept of minimum angle of resolution. There is a thing called as minimum angle of resolution. Now what does this mean? The meaning is that the minimum angle that this letter should sustain at the center of the lens that is at the nodal point, the minimum angle that this letter should sustain at the center of the lens that is the nodal point should be about 5 minutes of the arc. Only when this letter is sustaining this minimum angle, it will be visible from that much distance. So that means this letter is sustaining an angle of 5 minutes of the arc at a distance of 60 meters. Now this is the catch point. This letter is sustaining the angle of 5 minutes of the arc. That is a minimum angle of resolution, the minimum angle that is required to visualize that letter. And that is sustaining at a distance of 60 meters. Now what they have asked is actually the distance of 6 meters. So this is actually the catch point of the question. Now because they are asking it at 6 meters, now how to calculate this? At 60 meters if you see this angle is 5 minutes. So if you see at 6 meters it will become 10 times. So answer will become 50 minutes. So here the answer is actually 50 minutes of the arc. So don't get confused. The angle subtended by topmost letter at a distance of 60 meters is 5 minutes of the arc while at 6 meters that is one tenth of the distance the angle will multiply by 10 times and the angle will become 50 minutes of the arc. Question number third ocular feature of Sturge Weber syndrome. Now this Sturge Weber syndrome is actually a neurocutaneous syndrome and usually we see one or more ocular feature in the neurocutaneous syndromes. Now out of the five basic, we have five neurocutaneous syndromes or the phacomatosis, mainly we are concerned one with the neurofibromatosis, then we are concerned with this one, the Sturge Weber syndrome and then we have the third one which is important and that is your tuberous sclerosis. We have tuberous sclerosis. Now what are the different ocular features that we are getting in these syndromes? If I talk about the neurofibromatosis, if I talk about the neurofibromatosis, then what all things we are getting here? In neurofibromatosis, we have got the cafe olet spots. These are the hyperpigmented patches that we are getting. 
plus we are also getting the seizures because it's a neurocutaneous syndrome so we are getting a triad and what about the ocular feature ocular feature here consists of the lish nodules lish nodules and these lish nodules are nothing called as the but the iris hematomas they are nothing but the iris hematomas which are present over the iris all over something like these nodules are present and they are basically representing the hematomas of the iris now what about the sturge weber syndrome in the sturge weber syndrome basically we are getting the glaucoma so answer here is glaucoma we are getting the congenital glaucoma in most of the cases of sturge weber syndrome while the third is the tuberous sclerosis now what about this tuberous sclerosis in the tuberous sclerosis we are getting what you call as the strawberry angioma it is the strawberry angioma that we are getting in the cases of the tuberous sclerosis so again you should know what is the most important ocular feature present in all the three neurocutaneous syndromes or the phacomatosis it is the lish nodules that we are getting in cases of the neurofibromatosis then we have congenital glaucoma in the sturge weber syndrome and then we have the strawberry angioma that you are getting in tuberous sclerosis coming to the next one now the next question here we have a patient with acute pain and watering since 36 hours so we are having actually pain and watering since the 36 hours means it is of sudden onset so we have got a condition which is having sudden onset plus it is having painful also it's a painful condition along with a ulcer so this type of ulcer which is causing sudden onset painful diminution of vision on presence on the cornea along with the feathery margins the rolled out edges along with the hypopion now we have to consider that ulcer which will cause watering also which will cause pain also which is acute in onset along with the feathery margins and rolled out edges along with the minimum hypopion now we have got bacterial we have got fungal we have acanthamoeba and we have herpes simplex now out of these pain can be present in which ulcers pain can be present in bacterial also it can be present in the acanthamoeba also it is not a very very important feature in cases of fungal as well as the herpes because fungal ulcers if you are talking then they are mostly they are asymptomatic mostly they are asymptomatic and this is a thing which is not very much in suggestion and which is in favor of the fungal diagnosis here but the other things that will favor the diagnosis of the fungal corneal ulcer are the feathery margins along with the rolled out edges though mostly this fungal corneal ulcer are mostly asymptomatic you are having a number of signs now the signs which are actually will favor you and give you the diagnosis of this fungal corneal ulcer is basically this feathery margins with rolled out edges now let's see what are the different signs in cases of fungal corneal ulcer the first thing that you are getting is that it is grayish looking it is grayish because there is absence of the vascularization there is absence of vascularization which will lead to grayish color of the fungal corneal ulcer along with the feathery margins now why we are getting the feathery margins here the margins are feathery or we can say we have got the finger like processes these are the finger like processes that we are getting and it is due to the presence of the fungal hyphae along with the rolled out edges we are also having the rolled out these are the rolled out edges or also called as the raised edges so these are the things which will help you in making the diagnosis of fungal corneal ulcer because the feathery margins will never be found in bacterial corneal ulcer they are never found in acanthamoeba corneal ulcer as well as the herpes now what are the characteristic features of these then let us see the bacterial in the bacterial corneal ulcer 
what will happen if the diagnosis is the bacterial corneal ulcer then along with the pain we will also have the vascularization we will have the vascularization along with the lymphocytes so two important thing that are found in cases of the bacterial corneal ulcer will be the vascularization of the ulcer that's why it's very very painful along with the presence of lymphocytes which is not given here plus the hypopion hypopion has to be very very prominent here it's not minimal because bacterial hypopions are mostly dangerous along with the sterility bacterial hypopions are mostly sterile now why it's not acanthamoeba acanthamoeba corneal ulcer is common in the contact lens users so here we don't have any evidence of the context lens use along with this we, there is no ring abscess we do not have any evidence that can lead to the presence of the ring shaped abscess in the patient and then finally we come to the herpes simplex herpes simplex especially the two or one which is causing the ulcers uh, first of all it is not very uh, common for the herpes simplex two to cause corneal ulcers it is very common with the herpes simplex one plus the viral corneal ulcers if it is viral corneal ulcers then viral corneal ulcers are mainly causing the decrease corneal sensations so rather being causing the pain they are causing the decrease corneal sensations and what is the characteristic feature of these viral ulcers it is the dendritic ulcer so if it is a dendritic ulcer then it is the diagnosis goes in the favor of herpes if it's a bacterial ulcer then you should have a big hypopion you should have lymphocytes then if it's a canthamoeba ulcer then you should get evidence of the contact lens use then the trauma with the vegetative matter uh, trauma with the vegetative matter can cause fungal corneal ulcers also basically it's the soiling because this is the free living amoeba present in the soil plus along with the radiokeratoneuritis it is also causing the ring shaped ulcer so what we are left is with the fungal corneal ulcer yes fungal corneal ulcers are usually asymptomatic but they are they can cause pain uh, being a ulcer it can cause watering also and surely it will show feathery margins along with the rolled out edges now the next one yeah another important question which is on the nerve paralysis look at the picture here this given image signifies which of the following condition now let us see what are the things they are showing in these images here what they are showing is the ptosis so now ptosis is occurring due to the paralysis of the lps muscle and lps is actually supplied by the third cranial nerve therefore i can say that one of the things that is going in favor with the diagnosis is your oculomotor nerve palsy yes because ptosis is not present here ptosis is not present here and ptosis is also not present here now let us see other things if you see here if it's a third nerve paralysis all the muscles are paralyzed except for the two that is so4 and then we have lr6 now the patient is able to do only those movements which can be done by this superior oblique as well as the lateral rectus muscle now what are the movements of superior oblique and what are the movements of lateral rectus superior oblique because it's a oblique muscle therefore its main function will be rotation it will cause the intorsion therefore it will cause the intorsion then it is also causing the depression it's a depressor muscle and then it is causing the abduction if you see the lateral rectus then this also cause abduction now that means the patient will be able to do only those movements which are done by superior oblique as well as by the lateral rectus and out of these muscles the two things which are very very prominent is that both these muscles will be doing the abduction so patient will be abducting his eye only and he is not able to do the adduction then he is able to do the intorsion as well as depression so if you see here the patient is having the downward depression that is depressor movement is normal if you see when the patient is seeing up the eye is going out so this is actually the down and out position and down and out position of the eye the uh, downward and outward deviation of the eye 
along with the ptosis again signifies that it's a third nerve paralysis which is the most important isolated nerve paralysis now otherwise too also patients have post uh, the uh, Students have posted me many times how to differentiate between the third nerve paralysis and the internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Now, uh, dear students, it's not a very difficult task. As we have discussed, the third nerve paralysis here, first of all, it's ptosis. Ptosis will never be present in internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Plus, if you see here, there is limitation of every movement apart from intorsion, depression and abduction. While in cases of internuclear ophthalmoplegia, there is actually the limitation of only one movement and that is limitation of the adduction and that too in the affected eye. There is limitation of adduction and that too in the affected eye only. That's why there is no point of getting confused between the internuclear ophthalmoplegia and the third nerve paralysis. So answer here is the oculometer nerve paralysis that is the third nerve paralysis. Now coming to the next one. Now this is again an important topic. I always say that anti-glaucoma drugs always give you questions in AIMS as well as in NEAT. Now what they are saying actually here that the patient is diabetic and along with this diabetes he is having glaucoma along with CME. So basically the point of concern here is cystoid macular edema. The patient is having cystoid macular edema and which of the following should be least preferred or which should not be used. Now point is that that drug that you should avoid here is a drug which can cause or which can precipitate or which can increase the risk of this cystoid macular edema in the patient which is already present in the patient. Now let us see which of these drugs can increase the risk of or which can precipitate the cystoid macular edema. Now starting with the alpha agonist. Alpha agonist can cause the CME but that is very very rare and basically the side effects of alpha agonists are the allergic reactions. They are very commonly causing the allergy as well as they are also causing the tachyphylaxis. They are notorious for causing the tachyphylaxis. Now what is this tachyphylaxis? This means the tolerance. When you are using a drug for a very long time, it can cause tolerance. And you have to increase the dosage of this drug. And we cannot increase the dose of this drug. There is a limitation because of this allergic reactions. So the answer is not alpha agonist here. Let us come to beta agonist. Beta agonists, first of all, they are not used as an anti-glaucoma drug. It is actually the beta blockers. Beta blockers are the anti-glaucoma drugs and that too we can use here because beta blockers are mainly contraindicated in the cardiopulmonary diseases like we have gone we have bronchial asthma, we have COPD, we have bronchitis, we have coronary artery diseases, etc. Now we have got two options. We have prostaglandin analogs and then we have got the pilocarpine. Now first come to pilocarpine. Pilocarpine is actually a myotic drug. Now the only problem that it can cause is due to the induced myopia. The problem that it can cause is the induced myopia and again it has nothing to do with this cystoid macular edema. So by default also answer is this prostaglandin analogs. Let us see how. These prostaglandin analogs are actually the inflammatory mediators and because they are inflammatory mediators, however it's not that common, it's rare, but because being inflammatory mediators, they can rarely, obviously they can cause rarely cystoid macular edema. And therefore, the answer is the prostaglandin analogs out of the four drugs, the drug that you should avoid in a patient having cystoid macular edema is the prostaglandin analogs. This is a, a, again a visual question which they have asked this time. And uh, if you see, they have given you aspects having the bifocals because one is this glasses that is being used for the distance and another part is this one which we are using as the near correction. So this means this spectacle is actually presenting the bifocals. 
Now these bifocals, we can use them for the press biopia, we can use them for pediatric pseudophagia also and uh, we can use them for aphagia also. Now the question is that what type of bifocal it is. Uh, first of all, go with the most common. What is the most common indication of the bifocals? A person who is not having cataract, who has not undergone cataract surgery, who has not gone for the artificial lenses, that means no aphakia, no pseudophagia, then also after the age of 40 years, after the age of 40 years, he will be requiring the reading glasses. Why these reading glasses are actually required after the age of 40 years? This is for your press biopia. So this means the press biopia will be the most common indication for the use of these bifocals. So according to that, the answer is bifocals for the press biopia. Now, why it is not bifocals for pediatric pseudophagia or for adult aphakia? Uh, the reason is we are do not uh, very much prefer, we do not encourage the use of bifocals in cases of children. Now let's see what is the uh, reason. The reason is when you are using this correction, the near correction, it is also down. Usually what we are doing, we are giving the distance correction in the upward gaze and we are giving this near correction in the downward gaze. Now we are assuming by doing this, we are assuming that the near vision things, when we are supposed to see near, we are seeing only down. While the case may be different also, we may be seeing the near things in our primary gaze only and not down. And a child may not be able to accommodate these things. That is why we usually do not prefer giving bifocals in cases of pseudophagia. Uh, what about the bifocals for the aphakia? In cases of aphakia, basically aphakic person is a hypermetropic person. And aphakia is a highly hypermetropic condition and that is why we are basically giving the distance correction here and it is not a firmly a bifocal. That is why the bifocals that we are giving aphakia is not a correct word because these are the glasses which are having the distance correction. Both are having the distance corrections because aphakia is a strongly hypermetropic condition. So by default, the answer will be the bifocals for press biopia. For press biopia, one always require the bifocals. We need to give a distance correction. We need to give a near correction, which is not generally preferred in cases of children. That's why we are not giving. And the glasses that we are using actually for aphakia are not bifocals. They are for the distance correction. Thank you.